All right, for question seven, it says, consider the radial field F, which is the position vector R, which is xi plus yj plus zk, divided by its magnitude cubed, right? Where scalar R here is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And it says, recall that this radial field satisfies the inverse square law, right? If I take the magnitude of this vector, I get one over R squared. And in section 15.5, we showed that this vector field is source free on all of R3 excluding the origin, right? That's the domain of this vector field. So in other words, the divergence of the vector field is equal to zero on its domain, right? Now part A says, let S sub A be the sphere of radius A centered at the origin oriented outward. Part one says, explain why the divergence theorem cannot be used to compute the flux integral of the vector field over this surface uh, S sub A. All right, so, the divergence theorem requires that your vector field, well, be defined, and the furthermore, the uh, component functions of the vector field have to have continuous first-order partial derivatives over the solid region enclosed by the surface, right? Now, the origin is in this region enclosed by our sphere, S sub A, and so since we're not defined there, right, if I try to evaluate at the origin, I'm going to get a division by zero, the divergence theorem does not apply. All right, so that is that part. Now for the second part, right, because we cannot use the divergence theorem to compute the flux, part two is having us, com uh, having us compute the flux directly. Now in the very first question on the worksheet, we saw that uh, you know if I want to integrate a radial field over a sphere centered at the origin, well, one option is to use a parameterization of the sphere. That's pretty tedious. Uh, Instead, what we can do is just use the fact that the outward uh, pointing unit normal vector n is simply the unit vector that points in the direction of the position vector r. Right? I'm just going to take r and divide it by its magnitude. And if I'm on a sphere of radius a centered at the origin, right, the magnitude of r is just a. So n is r over a. So the dot product of f and n will be, well, f, which is r over its magnitude cubed, and if I'm along the sphere here, uh, that magnitude is just a, so I have r over a cubed dotted with n, which is r over a. Now this dot product of r with itself, that's the magnitude of r squared, which uh, again is just a, because we're on the sphere. So I get a squared over a to the fourth, and that's one over a squared. So the flux then is just going to be the surface integral of this constant 1 over a squared over the sphere. So that's just 1 over a squared times the surface area of the sphere. So we get 1 over a squared times 4 pi a squared, and the a squareds drop out, and we get a, a flux of positive 4 pi. All right, cool. So now let's have a look at part b. Okay, this says let S be any outward oriented closed surface that encloses the origin. Use the divergence theorem for hollow regions together with your answer to part A to compute the flux integral of the vector field across this surface S. Okay, so the idea here, this is really, uh, really, really similar to what we did uh, with Green's theorem where we had issues at the origin. Well here, right, I'm gonna choose uh, the radius of the sphere S sub A to be small enough to ensure that S sub A uh, does lie within this surface S here in green. Okay, and then I'm going to call D uh, the solid region that lies between these two surfaces. All right, and so what the divergence theorem uh, for hollow regions says, right, this is what we looked at in the last video, it says that the flux of the vector field throughout D, that's what this integral on the left is measuring is equal to the outward flux through uh, this outer surface S minus the outward flux through the sphere S sub A. Okay, now since our vector field is source free on all of R3 excluding the origin and this region D does not include the origin, right? This, uh, this sphere S sub A is sort of shielding uh, the origin uh, from D, okay, um, this left-hand side is just going to be zero, right, because the divergence of F is zero everywhere on this region D, 
Okay, and in part A, we computed the flux over the uh, the, the sphere S sub A. Right, that's just four pi. So I get that zero is equal to uh, the flux we're looking for over the surface S minus four pi. So the flux of the vector field over this surface S then is equal to four pi. All right, pretty nice. How about part C? It says the electric field due to a point charge Q located at the origin is given by the inverse square law. Okay, so the electric field E here is this quantity out front. Now these are all constants, right? I have Q, which is the point charge, divided by four pi times this constant epsilon naught, which we saw back in uh, section 15.6 when we talked about Gauss's law, right? This epsilon naught is what, what's known as the permittivity of free space. Okay, and then this constant stuff is measuring uh, the vector field R over R cubed. In other words, it's just multiplying this vector field F. Okay, so our electric field is a radial field that uh, satisfies the inverse square law. And it's, uh, the question goes on to say, use part B to derive Gauss's law. It says, if S is an outward oriented closed surface that encloses a point charge Q, then the flux of the electric field across S is given by, well, just Q divided by epsilon naught. And we've really done all of the work for this. Okay, so if I'm gonna compute the flux of the electric field over this uh, surface S, well, that's just, again, it's integrating Q over four pi epsilon naught times R over R cubed, right? So I'm gonna pull the constants out in front and R over R cubed, that's just uh, the, the vector field F. Right, and we we found that from part B that the flux of F over any uh, oriented uh, uh, closed surface S that it, uh, encloses the origin that's equal to four pi. So this is uh, Q over four pi epsilon naught times four pi. Four pi's drop out, and we get, as Gauss's law says, Q over epsilon naught. Yeah, pretty nice, cool. All right, and then for the very last one here. D, it says, consider the sphere of radius one centered at the point two, zero, zero. Explain why the divergence theorem here can be used to compute the outward flux of F across the sphere and then compute this value. All right, well, if this is our, our sphere, notice this thing totally misses the origin, okay? So since F is defined on all of D, its components have continuous partial derivatives on D, where D, by the way, is just the solid region enclosed by this sphere we can apply the divergence theorem to compute the flux of the vector field over this uh, sphere. And the divergence theorem then will tell us, well, the flux is equal to zero because we are source free on this region D, right? Again, we're missing the origin. All right, great. Well, that's gonna do it for this question. Thanks so much.